It's 7.30 in the evening across India. I'm Tanvi Taneja. Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Global. We'll bring you all the day's big stories from across India and the world. With me today from Washington DC is my colleague Nick Harper. Nick, good, mo uh, good evening from New Delhi. Good morning, Tanvi. It's 10 a.m. here in Washington, D.C. and 4 in the afternoon across Central Europe. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, India-Canada tensions remain high following Ottawa's murder allegations. And Ukraine's leader is here in Washington to petition President Biden for more funding. But first, the headlines. India says the allegations by Canada involving the killing of a pro-Khalistan figure are politically driven and the country needs to worry about its international reputation of providing a safe haven for terrorists. We have informed the Canadian government that there should be parity um, in strength and rank equivalence in our diplomatic uh, presence, in mutual diplomatic presence. India's Women Reservation Bill under discussion in the Upper House. The bill will reserve 33% seats for women lawmakers in the Lower House and State Assemblies. No final agreements reached at talks between ethnic Armenians and Azerbaijan. Both sides agree to meet again soon. Armenian protesters demand the Prime Minister's resignation after Karabakh surrender. Tensions are high between India and Canada. While briefing the media on the diplomatic row, spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs of India, Arindam Bakchi, said that the allegations by Canada made on the case of the killing of pro-Khalistan figure are politically driven. No specific information has been shared by Canada on this case, either then or before or after. We are uh, willing to look at any specific information. We have conveyed this to the Canadian side, made it clear to them that we are willing to look at any specific information that is provided to us. But so far, we have not received any such specific information. The Indian External Affairs Ministry spokesperson also said that India has informed the Canadian government that there will be a reduction of mutual diplomatic presence. We have informed the Canadian government that there should be parity. Um, in strength and rank equivalence in our diplomatic uh, presence, in mutual diplomatic presence. Um, their numbers here are much, are very much higher than ours in Canada. The details of this are being worked out, but I assume there will be a reduction. Further, the Indian Foreign Ministry spokesperson also clarified on why the High Commission and consulates uh, in Canada are unable to process visa applications. Uh, cases where we believe that our people are not being given a fair treatment or there have been discrimination, we do take these things up. Uh, but I would not like to recommend individual cases. But yes, discrimination in how visas are granted by the Canadian side is something of concern. Um, and there have been cases in the past. Reiterate that. Um, I think the same response I think somebody else raised uh, that yes, those were raised and they were rejected. E visas, yes, uh, e visas also are on. Uh, temporary suspension. All categories of visas are um, suspended. On to the United States now. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Wednesday pressed his case for financial help for his country with some of America's best-known billionaires. Today, Zelensky will return to Capitol Hill for his second visit, underscoring the urgency for more U.S. aid. My colleague Nick Harper is in Washington, D.C. He gives us more on this and other top stories around the world. Nick, over to you. Thanks, Tanvi. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is in Washington this Thursday for meetings on Capitol Hill and at the White House to convince leaders to continue to send aid. U.S. President Joe Biden has put forward a proposal for an additional $24 billion in spending for Ukraine, but support is waning among some members of Congress. DD India's Caroline Malone reports from Washington. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is in Washington, D.C., meeting with members of Congress to try and convince them that the United States should continue to support Ukraine. 
Now, the United States has already put forward more than $100 billion worth of aid, security, economic and humanitarian aid. But US President Biden is suggesting an additional package of $24 billion. But some members of Congress are concerned. They want to see more oversight in how this aid is being spent and a better long-term strategy. Um, it's coming at a time of difficult discussions in the United States over overall government spending. In fact, there's a deadline of September 30th for members of Congress to agree on government spending. And if they don't, then there could be a partial government shutdown. And that could lead to a suspension of pay for some federal employees. And some of the concern about continuing to support Ukraine is reflected in voters, particularly in Republican voters, about two thirds of which, according to polls, are now concerned that the US has already supported Ukraine too much with its spending. So Zelensky has um, a tough audience to speak to when he's meeting with members of Congress. He will then go on to the Pentagon to meet with defense leaders and then to the White House to meet with President Biden and First Lady Biden, along with his wife, Elena. Uh, they will continue to have discussions on this funding and Biden will likely want to hear more of a long-term strategy of how Ukraine is going to be using US aid. We know, of course, that Ukraine is part of a counter-offensive right now against Russia. And the National Security Council spokesperson, John 20, Kirby, okay. said only on Wednesday that they are seeing some progress from the Ukrainian side. But analysts have been saying that it is slow progress. So Biden is likely to want to hear more detail of how that is going forward. Caroline Malone in Washington for Didi India. Meanwhile, in Ukraine itself, more than 20 people have been injured after Russia launched missile attacks on at least three regions of the country. Russia launched the first attack in the Ukrainian city of Cherkasy, injuring at least 11 people. Rescue operations are underway as authorities believe more victims could be buried under the rubble. In another retaliation, Russia carried out its biggest missile strike in weeks across Ukraine, pounding energy facilities in Heshon. The fresh shelling by Russia has killed at least two people and injured five in that city. Power cuts have been reported in five Ukrainian regions, reviving memories of multiple airstrikes last winter. And Russia launched another massive airstrike on the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, on Thursday, leaving at least seven people injured. A fire was caused by the missile debris, which damaged non-residential buildings and an infrastructure facility. The mayor of the capital says seven people, including a girl aged nine, were injured in the attack. Well, Didi India's Megumi Lim reports on Russia's latest wave of missile attacks across Ukraine. Air raid sirens rang out across Ukraine in the early hours of Thursday as Russia launched one of its biggest missile attacks targeting Kiev and other parts of the country. Ukraine's armed forces said that Russia had fired 43 cruise missiles overnight and that Ukrainian air defenses shot down 36 of them. Two people were killed and at least 21 were injured, including a nine-year-old girl. Megumi Lim in Kiev reporting for DD India. Ukraine's security service and Navy have hit the Saki Air Base in Russian-occupied Crimea overnight, inflicting what they say is serious damage. That's per a Ukrainian intelligence source. The Russian military says it's destroyed about 19 Ukrainian drones over Crimea and the Black Sea. The military has not yet specified the number of casualties and the total damage. DD India's Dasha Chernyshova in Moscow sent us this report. Moscow has seen more attacks by the Ukrainian forces against the Russian territories. Russian Defense Ministry says air defense forces have destroyed 19 Ukrainian drones over the Black Sea and in Crimea. Three more were hit over the Kursk, Belgrade and Adel regions overnight. According to the governor of central Russian Adel region, Andrei Kovichkov, two more UAVs attempted to target fuel and energy facilities in the region. They were also downed, causing no damage or casualties. In the meantime, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said at the UN Security Council meeting on Ukraine that the US and its allies have openly meddled in the Ukrainian affairs since the breakup of the Soviet Union. 
He said that the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Victoria Nuland publicly admitted at the end of 2013 that Washington spent 5 billion U.S. dollars to nurture politicians in Kiev who are amenable to the West. He accused the West of evading a substantive conversation based on the U.N. Charter requirements, saying that the West does not want to have an honest dialogue on the Ukraine-related issues. Dasha Chernyshova reporting in Moscow for DD India. Moving on now, and no final agreement has been reached in talks between Karabakh Armenians and Azerbaijan. A day after Armenian separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh agreed to a Russian-brokered ceasefire and disarmament. The two sides are discussing the future of ethnic Armenians living in Karabakh. The Karabakh Armenians said the details of the ceasefire agreement still needs to be fully fleshed out. While Azerbaijan has said it is hard to expect that all issues between the two sides could be resolved in just one meeting. A representative of the Russian peacekeeping force also attended the talks. Internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, Karabakh is mainly populated by ethnic Armenians. Meanwhile, Karabakh Armenians have demanded security guarantees before laying down their weapons. They say that details of the Russia-brokered ceasefire agreement with Azerbaijan still needs to be worked out. The Armenian separatists said that the ceasefire ended military action, but details of the final agreements have not yet been decided. Meanwhile, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has said that Armenia needs to be free of any conflict. Many believe that in this tense regional environment in the face of occasional military conflicts, it is not adequate to talk about peace. But particularly in these conditions, peace should be valued and peace should not be confused with a truce or a ceasefire. Peace is an environment that is free from conflicts, interstate and interethnic conflicts. All of this as Russian peacekeepers are sheltering 5,000 Karabakh residents after they evacuated them from dangerous areas. Tensions erupted on Wednesday after Azerbaijan attacked Karabakh. The assault ended after Armenian separatists and Baku reached a ceasefire brokered by Russia. Armenia said that it was not part of the ceasefire deal. Russian troops have been stationed in Karabakh since the 2020 Armenia-Azerbaijan war. Well, Didi India's Alex Kadier reports from Brussels. Well, the latest is that those talks are ongoing between those ethnic Armenians who've been uh, fighting uh, against those Azerbaijani troops. Those uh, uh, ethnic Armenian fighters are being asked by Azerbaijan to drop their weapons and to cease all hostilities permanently. They have, there is this temporary ceasefire, uh, as we've heard in uh, the last few hours in the last day. But the question now is about what next for those uh, ethnic Armenian fighters in that region of Karabakh. And uh, one of the things they say as part of these negotiations is that they will need security assurances. They do not uh, want to have uh, to, to drop their weapons and to then be prosecuted or persecuted by the Azerbaijani authorities. At least that is uh, their take on this issue. So these discussions will be ongoing. It's clear that Azerbaijan now has control of that region after 32 people now have lost their lives as a result of this offensive. And the uh, way forward is about trying Trying to find a more lasting peace. Well, that's it from me here in Washington, D.C. Handing back to you, Tanvi, in the studio. Thank you very much, Nick. Nick Harper joining us from Washington, D.C. You're watching DD India Global, still to come on the show. Media Baron Rupert Murdoch steps down as chairman of Fox Corporation and Fox News, will be appointed chairman emeritus of both companies. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina says that the United Nations must lead by example to bring women in leadership positions. Information shapes our reality. One app stands out, helps you stay ahead of time. Introducing the DD India app, your gateway to a world of news right at your fingertips. Your most trusted source of news goes global, goes digital.
explore a world of options, top stories, live updates, in-depth analysis and more. Stay informed wherever you are. Real-time alerts keep you ahead of the curve always. The DD India app connecting you to the world one story at a time. Download now and explore the world of knowledge, insights. Welcome back. You're watching Did India Global. I am Tanvi Taneja. Next news from India now about the Women's Reservation Bill. About being, after being passed in the lower house on Wednesday with 454 members in support, the Women's Reservation Bill is being discussed in the upper house of Indian Parliament right now. The 128th Constitutional Amendment Bill reserves 33% seats for women parliamentarians in the lower house and in state assemblies. Opening the debate on the bill in the upper house of parliament, ruling party president J.P. Nadda praised the Indian prime minister for his initiatives to take forward this bill. भारत की संस्कृति में महिलाओं का बहुत बड़ा स्थान रहा है। ये हमारा और आपका नहीं है, हमारे को, हमारे पूर्वजों ने, हमारी संस्कृति ने महिलाओं को जिस तरीके से समाज के में प्रतिस्थापित किया वह बताता है कि हमेशा ही हमारी संस्कृति में महिलाओं का स्थान उज्जवल रहा है इसलिए वो पिछड़े हैं वो असहाय हैं वो अबला नारी ये शब्दावली हमारी नहीं रही है और हमने नारी को शक्ति के रूप में देखा देवी के रूप में देखा और समाज को दृष्टि देने वाला और इसीलिए प्रधानमंत्री जी जब कहते हैं विमेन एम्पावरमेंट तो वो हमेशा विमेन लेज डेवलपमेंट की बात करते हैं। the lower house of Indian Parliament is discussing the success of India's successful lunar mission Chandrayaan-3. The upper house on Wednesday unanimously adopted the resolution congratulating the Indian scientists on the success of Chandrayaan-3. Chandrayaan-3 ने चंद्रमा पर अपने कदम रखे हैं। यह एक ओर इसरो की सफलता तो है ही साथ ही यह इस बात का भी द्योतक है कि हमारे देश का साइंटिफिक इकोसिस्टम जिसमें करोड़ों करोड़ों भारतीयों ने जाने अनजाने अपना योगदान दिया है वह अपनी आज शेप ले रहा है यह दिखाता है कि हमारे स्कूल्स हमारे कॉलेजेस और यूनिवर्सिटीज में साइंस की पढ़ाई बेहतर हो रही है और हमारी इंडस्ट्रीज भी अच्छी गुणवत्ता वाले प्रोडक्ट्स और सप्लाई कर रही हैं। Still with India, the fourth G20 Infrastructure Working Group meeting is underway in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. Discussions are being held on promoting private investment in urban infrastructure. This meeting is being chaired by the Finance Ministry of India and the co-chairs are Brazil and Australia. During the two-day meeting, representatives of the G20, invited countries and international organizations will be given a tour to the world-famous UNESCO Heritage Temples of Khajuraho. A number of art and cultural programs are also being lined up for the evening. A number of pilot projects have gone to 10. Uh, if you all remember that we started this process with four, but uh, uh, due to the overwhelming response from all the uh, friends and members here, now we have 10 pilot projects. Uh, there's one project which is there in two sectors, so if we count that as two, then it's 11, otherwise it's 10 unique projects that uh, we are able to uh, study and Omar will be presenting the results today. The United Nations is celebrating 75 years of human rights. India has preached human rights since Vedic times. The motto of G20 this year was one earth, one family, one future. This summarizes it all. A two-day conference of National Human Rights Institutions of Asia-Pacific was held in New Delhi. DD India's Vishal Baristo had an exclusive conversation with Chairperson of the National Human Rights Commission in India, Justice Arun Mishra, regarding where India stands for its human rights standards. United Nations is celebrating 75 years of human rights and we are here at a global conference of Asia and Pacific region on human rights. I have with me chairperson of National Human Rights Commission, Justice Mishra. Let's talk to him and find out. Sir, when we talk about uh, human rights, India is the mother of democracy. Where do we stand as far as a nation is concerned? 
We are definitely mother of democracy and best democracy in the world. Mark Twain has said so long back when he discovered India. And uh, according to me, our human rights are based in our culture and they, were, they are to be found in our scriptures, Rig Veda. Globalization is not a new concept which has developed. That finds place in Rig Veda, which has been ultimately recognized as world heritage also. So our ethos goes, everybody is equal, is adopted Ahinsa. And then he, during his regime, there was total ban on cutting of forest, destroying forest, cutting trees. This is this was the awareness to 300 years BC. So this uh, protection of preservation of culture, intergenerational equity, scarce resources to be preserved, all this finds place in Prathvi Sukta also. So our uh, ethos, culture, and then uh, one thing is more, uh, we live in various diverse culture. And we have assimilated several cultures. And you see, uh, Parsi, Muslim, Christians. So, so much uh, assimilation is there in Indian culture. That is our strength. So there you hear the chairperson of National Human Rights Commission. He says that the commission is always there to take stock of the situation, whether it is a Manipur or suicide case, cases of quota, and India has set an example for the world when it comes to human rights. With cameraman Sumit in Delhi, this is Vishal Beristo for GD India. Foundation for Reproductive Health Services India celebrated International Safe Abortion Day today with a special focus on media interactions, rights-based reporting focused on safe abortion. According to the World Population Report 2022 of the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, unsafe abortion is the third leading cause of maternal deaths in India and about eight women die every day from unsafe abortion-related causes. Foundation for Reproductive Health Services India एक संस्था है जो हम लोग safe abortion और contraceptive services पे काम करते हैं। We are an affiliate of MSI Reproductive Choices। हमारे पास we built a coalition, a member organisation of 120 plus organisations which is called Pratigya Campaign for Gender Equality and Safe Abortion। Through this coalition हम क्या करते हैं कि we work on each other's strengths। हम एक दूसरे के strength पे काम करते हैं हम लोग व्हील रीइन्वेंट नहीं करते हैं हम लोग एडवोकेसी करते हैं ताकि एक्सेस टू सेफ अबॉर्शन बढ़े हमें पता है कि सेफ अबॉर्शन को लेके अभी भी काफी स्टिग्मा और टबू है हमारी कोशिश यही है एफआरएचएस इंडिया और प्रतिज्ञा कैंपेन से कि एक्सेस बना रहे जर्नी इजी रहे सेफ अबॉर्शन सीकर के लिए और अवेयरनेस बढ़े नाउ लेट्स टेक अ लुक एट अदर स्टोरीज मेकिंग न्यूज़ अराउंड द वर्ल्ड Media Baron Rupert Murdoch has stepped down as the chairman of Fox Corporation and Fox News. Murdoch's resignation has ended his seven-decade career. Murdoch's son, Lachlan Murdoch, will take over as sole chairman of News Corporation and will continue as Fox Corp's executive chair and CEO. Rupert will be appointed chairman emeritus of both the companies. Addressing the annual meeting of the UNGA Platform of Women Leaders session in New York, Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said that the UN must lead by example to bring women in leadership positions to make positive impacts in the lives of other women. Prime Minister Hasina stressed on the need to elevate the narrative from participation to leadership and said that the time has come for the UN to have its first woman UN Secretary General. At least four people died while five were injured after an explosion took place at a gas pipeline on a motorway construction site in Romania. The injured people were admitted to hospital while the firefighters brought the fire under control. A probe is being launched to investigate the cause of explosion. Greek public sector workers on Thursday went on a strike to protest against the labour law changes. 
The Greek government has claimed that the changes will boost employment. On the other hand, opposition has alleged that the changes are an assault on workers. Many schools across Greece were closed while state hospitals operated on emergency staff. So that's all in this edition of DD India Global. Do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter and Instagram at DD India Live. You can also find us online on YouTube at DD India. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Tanvita Neja from all of us here in New Delhi. Thanks for watching. Namaskar.